샌펠레그리노에서 후원하는 월드 베스트 레스토랑이라는 랭킹이 있는데 이 랭킹은 전 세계 셰프들과 또 미식가들이 엄청나게 주목하는 레스토랑계의 아카데미상 같은 존재예요. 이 월드 베스트 레스토랑에서 남미 레스토랑에서 최초로 상위권을 차지한 더 센트럴이라는 레스토랑의 헤드 셰프님인 빌킬리오 마티네스 셰프님이 제 옆에 앉아 계십니다. Hello, I'm Virgilio Martinez. I just landed from Lima, Peru, and I'm enjoying Korea festival, congress, cooking, enjoying learning, uh, speaking to people, and getting to understand more about the Korean cuisine. 한식 세계와에 관련된 여러 가지 행사를 하기 위해서 한국에 오셨는데. 바쁜 일정에서 시간을 빼서 저랑 같이 이거 비치나에서 한식을 기반으로 한 파인 다이닝을 같이 맛보면서 요즘 미국인들이 페루 기반 파인 다이닝과 한식 기반 파인 다이닝에 열광하는지에 대한 이야기를 나눠볼까 합니다. Do you think they are nervous in there knowing that you are you're here? <laughs> I gotta tell them that I eat everything, so no worries. Like I'm not picky eater. So how familiar are you with Korean food? I've been trying Korean food uh, abroad, mostly in New York, a lot. Very popular, mm -hmm. actually, over there. I think it's growing a lot, and it has very unique ingredients. This is something that I, I do enjoy a lot about Korean cuisine, is the, the, the way you are treating plants and herbs. And this whole idea, which I think is part of uh, your heritage, you know, these medicinal plants that they play a good role in gastronomy. Mm -hmm. Not as a medicine mm -hmm. yet, but I think it will be the future. Have you gone to like a uh, street market and tried to yeah, 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 many. Like, uh, I, had this, I just had this uh, like dry squid. I've tried the, the live uh, things moving, you know, I, this is quite uh, interesting. And okay. I, I think it's good for the video, for Instagram, you know, whatever, <laughs> it, it goes everywhere. Uh, I mean, your level of your street food is very high. Mm -hmm. you know, it's the same problem for some other uh, like Mexican food. Like when you have this high level for the fine dining, it's difficult mm -hmm. to impress. Korean students study the longest hours of any country in the world. So usually our entire middle school, high school days, we survive eating street food. So a lot of Korean people, when they, um, when they are like 35 years old, they're working at a company, they're really tired. The first thing they want to eat is usually some street food they ate when they were 13, 14 years old, when they were preparing for college exam. But you know, when, when you have like a, the comfort food, like a so good, mm -hmm. you know, going to the fine dining, uh, it really has to surprise you. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna miss the chance, you know? <laughs> Should we dig in? Sure. It takes like green, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like this. What do you think? Is something common for you? It tastes like there is a dish called gujarpan. It's a plate that looks mm, like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you have different uh, vegetables. Mm. And then you usually have a wrap, Korean tortilla, and we eat them. It's like a crepe. Yeah. But the difference uh, between that and this is that the wrap was made from fried seaweed. Yeah. But one of your dishes yesterday I saw that, what seemed like fried seaweed. Yeah, we're using like, a, we used uh, about eight kind of seaweed and algae. And uh, yeah, we made like a, like a cracker mm -hmm. out of the seaweed. We produce, we consume seaweed uh, also in ceviches, you know, very, very common. Mm -hmm. But um, when we travel and we cook abroad, we try to do quite like an adaptation to the places where we go. So we have a great opportunity to, to showcase our seaweed. So this is, this is going to be a good place. So mm -hmm. I think yesterday when we cooked uh, seaweed, I think uh, it was good to showcase uh, Peruvian seaweed. It's actually very delicate, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, like, it looks like um, stronger. But when, when you taste it, it tastes like um, very mild, red pepper, and the cockle, like uh, slightly steamed, and the caviar, just like perfect, yeah. very well balanced. So what are some um, common dishes in Peru that you'd recommend for a Korean tourist going to Peru for the first time? For, uh, for sure, ceviche. Mm -hmm. Octopus ceviche, uh, siba ceviche, scallop ceviche, lobster ceviche, with uh, different chili peppers. You know, mm -hmm. we have like a rocoto, yellow pepper, and then anticuchos is a beef heart uh, skewer with a chili dressing. And then we do rice uh, with duck. We call it arroz con pato. And then a uh, few causas. Causa is a dish made with potatoes and, and, and some fillings like tuna or seafood. 
So I, I will recommend like uh, mostly go for, for seafood and then of course uh, quinoa dishes, mm -hmm. um, corn dishes. You have amazing varieties of corn in Peru. I was surprised that in one of the, the dishes that you presented yesterday, there was a, a dish made from five different types of corn. Yeah. That, that was pretty cool. And we call it the land of corn. I read in a book that the, uh, the Mesoamerica used to have something like 5,000 different varieties of corn. You know, so yeah, yeah, mostly from one part of Chile, Bolivia, Peru, and then going to Mexico. But of course, you know, in these modern times, you know, uh, the industry, mm -hmm. they need one or two, which normally are not the best. Mm -hmm. So basically what happened in Peru is because we're in the Andes, in the mountains, uh, we get to see how still, you know, normal agriculture, that the same agriculture that happened for, for years. So it's producing these um, ancestral ingredients. So, mm -hmm. so that's why we get to see this organic ancestral corn mm -hmm. and potatoes and mm -hmm. different tubers. So I've seen this before. Like it's very common, right? Yes. So if you go to a Guangzhou you know, they, the meat vendors used to just chop it up and mix it with pear, soy sauce, and, and you know, give it out as samples. And that's where that comes from. Do you dry age meat here? No, I think that's a fine dining invention because Korean people are so familiar with this dish and they've never tasted it dry aged and that they can only do it at a fine dining restaurant. That's probably why they do it also. But how so, do you see the people? Is, is the people like open-minded to see changed uh, recipes and, and, and flavors, new flavors? I think the advantage that Korea has is that because Fine dining itself is a, a, a Western concept. So when they come to a fine dining restaurant uh, based in Korean cuisine, they don't expect the recipes to be something that's traditional. Okay, okay. They expect some adaptation of a Korean food to Western formula. And that's what I guess gives uh, chefs a, a greater latitude in creativity. How uh, do you think this compares with uh, the traditional takta de boeuf? Same idea of, of being light, lighter. Mm -hmm. um, the well balance of the of the fruit and the the meat, mm -hmm. and of course you can taste the dry aged meat, so mm -hmm. it's very different mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah, the leaves and the fish. I like this kind of food. Mm. Fun thing about Korean uh, mm -hmm. way of eating is that food is the soup and the rice. So you'll have, have here something strange, like we already had four hundred grams of beef, and then people say let's have shiksa. Oh really? Right, because if the rice and soup didn't come yet, that it's was not, that was appetizer. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> rice noodle or soup? Noodle soup. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> wow. Now that we have porridge, and soon they'll bring out rice. So this is the meal. Officially, we start with <laughs> the meal. You can usually only have it in April. Oh, really? Mm. Do you kind of respect uh, seasonality a lot? Our parents did. But I think most Koreans of our generation, they don't cook at home. So we don't even know what really goes into yeah, the well, set. This is a whole problem. Like, uh, mm. It happens everywhere. Like, uh, mm. we, are, we are losing connection with, uh, with nature, with seasonality. So mm. I truly enjoy this idea when, you know, like um, all these different plates, individual different plates, and you can play around. Like, there's no order. My way is like, um, you know, the fine dining, or, well, uh, tasting menus. So and you have to go, you go with one dish and then you have to wait for the other and the other and the other. Kind of lose the, the, the freedom mm -hmm. to choose, you mm -hmm. know. One of the, the things that Korean people enjoyed a lot was that you take lettuce and then you think about what you're going to put on the lettuce for this particular bite. So now on the lettuce, I'm going to put some scallion kimchi, yeah. two pieces of garlic and one piece of short rib. And that's your bite. It's your bite. Individual, right. like it's so playful, mm -hmm. it's so fun. So there's a lot of uh, adventures and, and going things going on in the in the table. Here's your lunch now. Okay. <laughs> but this is beautiful. Like for me, it's something new. Like yeah, people used to sleep on the floor. Okay. So we had this these tables called the soban, which were small eating plates with short legs on. Fantastic.
If you see countries that are coming up in the fine dining scene right now, each countries like Peru or countries like Korea, how do you think these two countries, what do they have in common that allows their cuisine to rise on the international scene as opposed to countries like India or China, which have a huge population, diverse cuisine, and a, a huge land mass? Yeah, this is a really good question. It's, uh, it's about like, uh, you know, Korea, Peru. Uh, we are just touching the unknown. Like, uh, we are like, uh, we have so many ingredients. We have a uh, biodiversity. We have uh, many stories to tell. You know, people now, when they go for fine dining, they want to be surprised by, by something different. What I remember, like, um, the fine dining was coming from France. You wanted to experience a fine dining restaurant you had to go to a French restaurant. And then he moved to Spain a bit, you know, and then he moved to, to the States. Now the whole world of fine dining is looking for something different. Mm -hmm. So you start to say like uh, Korea, Peru, Mexico, mm -hmm. you know, opportunity can come from, from different parts of the world. Like don't forget about uh, Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. you know, with its amazing cuisine. Let's not, do not forget about South America, even, you know, you see now Copenhagen, you know, uh, the whole movement of, of Nordic cuisine. If the Nordics are doing this, mm -hmm. why not all of the countries? Geopolitics, you know, mm. gastro geopolitics. <laughs> <laughs> that means a lot because mm -hmm. the people start to move to that place, to move to live, to live in that place. They start to build hotels, you know, Airbnbs, and they start to, to find some other uh, disciplines like arts, music. So the pop culture moved to that place sometimes because of the food or even sometimes because of a restaurant. Mm -hmm. I heard that a lot of people who go to Lima, before, if somebody was traveling to Peru, they were going because they want to see Machu Picchu. But I heard that some people are going to Peru to go to your restaurant. So some people go to your, their priorities are more the restaurant than going to this. Um... It's quite shocking, you know, because of course for my generation to be in a way competing to huge and big Machu Picchu. Mm -hmm. That's why fine dining restaurant has to have some purpose and, and some other things beyond good gastronomy, good hospitality. It mm -hmm. has to, we got to think, like in our case at Central, we got to think as a movement coming from the mountain, from the Andes of Peru, and not even Peru, from Latin America. In Lima, we're, we don't compete with chefs. Uh, we're sharing things with chefs because we understand that people will come to Lima for the food. Maybe they want to go for a few restaurants, but, but why not go, go into seven, eight, nine restaurants? Mm -hmm. So in your restaurant, you have people who are coming to taste the top Peruvian cuisine from all over the world. And do you adapt your food knowing that people who are not Peruvian, who are not familiar with Peruvian textures or flavor will taste it? Or do you think when it's above a certain quality, it's a universal, everybody understands it? Normally, like uh, per day, we cook for 15 nationalities. So it will be very difficult to me to adapt my system to every single nationality because I know some people they eat less salty, some people they don't like, uh, let's say, cilantro. So we, through a few years, I would say like uh, 16 years, we've de developed one style, one method. We can express our ingredients, we can express Peru in a different way. Mm -hmm. So. I take tradition as an inspiration, but I need to, in a way, tradition has to be preserved with innovation. Okay, so it's not something that Peruvian people eat every day, but it's a reinterpretation that's been abstracted in a way, that's been studied. Yeah, because, so. because even Peruvians, when they go to Central, they say like, where is my lomo saltado, my ceviche, my this classical Peruvian dish? They say, no, no, we don't do this because it doesn't allow me the position to do some innovation. Mm -hmm. So I, I say like, it's 100% Peruvian because uh, we're using ingredients that are coming from one ecosystem in Peru, and we just try to do an interpretation of beauty, what happens in, in the landscape of this specific part in, in Peru. Let's say the Amazon, the mountains, the Andes, and places where Peruvians probably haven't been before. And that's why also for Peruvian is another exploration. Okay. In Asia, when we think traditionally of royal cuisine or aristocratic cuisine, we have Japan and Thailand who still have kings oh, yeah, and emperors yeah, yeah. but for some reason the western consumers you know the western food lovers they don't look at kaiseki or they don't look at thai royal cuisine and say fine. okay that's fine dining that's something else what makes fine dining fine dining and why isn't kaiseki or thai royal cuisine why isn't that fine dining yeah i think this idea of luxury in the fine dining i think is it will be always but it's not that cool anymore because of, of trends people is moving to this fine dining experiences where you see things that you've never experienced before. Mm -hmm. So that's what I consider that um, traditional Kaiseki fine dining. It's very difficult to understand nowadays in the modern life. This stiff 
elegant experiences are not that welcome. That's a powerful message. Wow. So uh, you worked in Madrid, Barcelona, Bogota, New York. You worked in many different cities. What are some of the differences between people's taste in, let's say, Spain, South America, and North America? Many differences. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. In South America, you you will see like a lot of uh, sour, like uh, the use of lime. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, you, you can see avocado everywhere. You mm. know, quinoa, potatoes, and very humble ingredients uh, mm -hmm. taken to the to the next level. Mm -hmm. You know, in Mexico, you see tacos, lots of, you know, chili, spicy, very, very high. And then when I go to Spain, like, I'm very, very proud of their, their food and also regional cuisine. But uh, the way they use um, olive oil, the way they treat the, the, the seafood, you know, like, um, with no sauces. So sometimes, you know, I see, like, uh, in Latin America, we overpower, you know, the seafood or the meat or any ingredient or even a veggie. Whether in France, I see that uh, they're looking for the harmony, the balance of sweet, sour, you know, this um, looking for perfection and balance. So quite hard, you know, to standardize, you know, the global palate, mm -hmm. which is happening now, actually, mm -hmm. you know, like because we are living in times where you, you, you go to a city and you see international cuisine everywhere. Mm -hmm. And now you see Vietnamese, and you see Indian food, mm -hmm. and then you see African, and then you see Korean, and you see Japanese. Well, the list is huge. So nowadays, I think we are standardizing our palates. Mm. Right now, like you're saying, Peru and Korea are sort of uh, really hot right now, really trendy. What do you think uh, will be the next country to come up? It's a tricky question, huh? because uh, I don't see that it's going to be like, like before. Like uh, people were saying, like, uh, who's going to be the next destination, mm -hmm. the next cooking destination? Now I see that in New York, Korean food is like on the top level mm -hmm. of, of restaurants, like uh, so many restaurants. But I don't know if, if we can consider that uh, there's going to be like one destination. Mm -hmm. And it's actually better for people who are eating. So we are at the end of our meal. How would you summarize what you've experienced in Seoul so far? I got to say, like, I, this is, what I experienced here is, is a complete gastronomic experience, you know, mm -hmm. because you can see the produce from scratch, from the soil, mm -hmm. ingredients from the plants. I experienced making uh, soy sauce, mm -hmm. Different sauces, you know, uh, in natural spaces, uh, not far from the city. And then I get to see, you know, in one hour, I get to have this really good experience, you know, fine dining Korean experience. So, and then I go to another place and I get to enjoy street food in uh, top levels. I mean, if I had to summarize, you know, my experience, it, will, it has to be like, it has to be amazing. You must be proud of this cuisine and, and this um, culture that you are, as a Korean, you, you guys, you are expressing something amazing because uh, for the top level of gastronomy, I think nowadays uh, we just don't want uh, nice food and, and tasty food, you know, we just want the, the story of the food and, and here you can see it. Thank you. <laughs> 사실 이제 셰프님이 한국에 오시게 된 거는 난로 학원이라고 하는 한식의 과학화를 추구하는 재단이 있어요. 그래서 거기서 마르틴 셰프님이 초청으로 오신 거예요. 그래서 첫날 한국의 여러 외식업을 하는 분들을 위해서 식사를 해 주셨습니다. 그래서 저도 그 디너에 갔었는데 그 메뉴 컨셉이 굉장히 재밌어요. 첫 번째 코스 이름이 해발 마이너스 50이에요. 그러니까 바다에 50m 수심에서 살고 있는 시푸드 위주가 됐고 그 다음에 두 번째 코스는 갑자기 쭉 올라옵니다. 그래서 해발 4,200m. 백두산 위에 한라산을 얹는 높이니까 이제 우리나라에선 존재하지가 않는 고도인데 그 다음에 전 재밌던 게 평원 2,700m였어요. 그러니까 백두산 꼭대기의 높이가 페루에서는 평원이구나. 이 말티에스 셰프님이 아, 우리나라는 이 바다부터 4,000m 고지까지 다양한 식품이 자라는 곳이구나 라는 거에 착안을 해서 그 컨셉으로 파인다닝을 만들었고 그거를 세계 사람들이 얼마나 주목하는지를 보면서 내가 나고 자라고 내가 상징하는 우리 음식이 나온 이 세계와 문화를 어떤 방식으로 전달할까를 고민하는 스토리텔러로서 이 셰프라는 직업이 진화하고 있구나라는 걸 느끼게 된 시간이었습니다. 이 음식을 어제 먹고 와서 생생하게 그 음식에 대해서 제가 감명이 남아 있는 상태에서 이 세계 지금 넘버원 셰프님으로 인정받고 있는 말티에 셰프님과 같이 한식을 먹을 수 있는 건 정말 소중한 기회였고요. 이런 기회를 우리 궁금이 분들과 나눌 수 있어서 오늘 정말 좋은 시간이었습니다. 오늘 조석연의 탐구 생활은 여기서 마무리하겠습니다. 다음번엔 더 재밌는 문화 역사 이야기로 찾아뵙겠습니다. 안녕히 계세요. Ciao. Hi everyone, this is Virgilio Martinez. I'm here in Seoul enjoying this food and in this gastronomical capital. Just exposing my food, Peruvian food, uh, the food I do in Lima, the food I do in the mountains, the food I do in the um, Amazonia of Peru. So please, if you get the chance to fly 
from Seoul one day to Lima. I'll be waiting for you. Bye bye.